What's up, y'all? This is Raheem, man. Live, reporting live from Malik Jackson Boxing Fitness Gym. And we're here with Philly Fame TV. Oh man, I'm chilling. Fresh home after what, 21 years? 21, uh, almost 21. Just a couple months shy of it, man. Right. And when um, you came home, you had surprised your mom, and uh, somebody had recorded it and threw it up on online, and it went viral. Like you just told me, like on Facebook, got like 5.2 million views, something like that. Yeah, 5.2 on 5.2 million on Facebook alone. Right. And then all the other social media outlets went crazy with it. So, you know, here we are today. All right, you said like Shade Room and stuff shade like that. Shade Room, no gun, no gun Zone, everywhere, man, everywhere. Right, right. And it was a deep video, you know what I mean? Vince, though you surprised your mom, she didn't know you was coming home. So we, we usually start at the beginning, but I want to start here for, for a change. Like, what was that like for you, like, coming home, surprising your mom, she didn't know you was coming, your family, and at the same time, you actually came to speak to the youth as well at the same at the same time. So speak about, about that experience. Well, for starters, man, like initially all I wanted to do was surprise my mom, man. So I, you know, I had organized it and constructed this plan with my wife to try to, you know, bring a bring a hell of a twist to it, man, and give us something to be really happy about because two days prior to my release was my birthday. And even though I don't celebrate birthdays, I know that means a lot to my to my mom, man. So Two days later was my release date. My brother Dewan, Packy Williams said to me, man, yo, listen, man, I got something set up. For I didn't know what it was. He said, I got something set up for you. I need you to meet me at Felton, Feltonville Rec Center. So I'm like, all right, cool. We get down there, everything is good. I'm listening to these young guys, man, talk about their experiences in the street and how rough they think they are. And so I'm blown away because it reminded me of myself when I was 16 years old and the mindset that I had then. So he gave me the platform after hearing their testimonies and the things that they thought that they were, you know, all about. And I shared with them, man, like, listen, man, that ain't what it's hitting for. Y'all think y'all got it figured out. But at the end of the day, man, you know, I gave my spill, let them know what was real. And then we had sent the Uber because my mom thought that day that, you know, she was being taken to shop for me for my release. She didn't think that she was going to the jail or going to get picked up or anything for that. So we sent the Uber for her. When the Uber got there, man, and I heard her voice upstairs, and she came downstairs, I tried to hide as much as I could, and the anxiety inside of me, man, I couldn't, I couldn't shake it, man, I couldn't pull it away, so I started getting nervous, and I jumped in, boom, what's up, mom, how you doing? Give me a chair. Give me a chair. Give me a chair, bro. Here, this one. Here. Come on. Here, sit her down. Sit her down right here, bro. Sit her down. Sit her down. Sit her down. Have a seat, mama. Another family brought back together. I got my kids. I got my kids. I, I got my kids. And so it was priceless to see her respond like that, man. But back to your question about the young guys, man, and why that why was that so important to me? It was important to me because growing up at that 16 year old age that I was, nobody didn't teach me nothing right. Everybody who I called my old head, my big cuz, my homies and all that, none of them, none of them pushed that positive motivation to me that I needed. So when I got the opportunity to come out there and talk to the youth, come out here and talk to the youth, that's what I want to do, man. I want to come out and make a difference, man. And that's why I did what I did the way I did it. Right, right, right. Alright, so let's jump back to the very beginning because you originally got sentenced at 16 years old to that to that bit that you did. So let's go prior to that. So you told me like you grew up in the P, that's where you're originally from. So let's describe, I want you to describe, you know, your upbringing, your family life, the environment, what, what your childhood was like. 
Okay, growing up, man, in South Philly, man, at a young age, I credit every almost everything that made me of that, of that time that made me who that made me who I am today. Because I'm saying, growing up in a single parent home is hard. It was either my grandmother or my mother. And when my mother fell short to substance abuse, my grandmother stepped up. And so it was us just growing up in the house, man. And 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 my grandmother worked at a bar. So when she worked at the when she was at the bar, I would be at the babysitter's house. The babysitter never really cared. So I just ran the streets. And then as you know, as the as the cycle goes, man, we just progress from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. You know, at 11 years old, man, I found myself being taught how to, or I'm going to go back even further than that. I'm going to say nine. At nine years old, my story started in the streets. Started with sneaking joints out the ashtray. Big no-no. Started sneak, sneaking cigarettes. Big no-no. I didn't know that then, but I'm saying it now to, the, to those viewers watching. Um, then... Just hanging out, being bad, being mischievous, man. All the negative behaviors that we had, man, our innocence was over once we saw how we could be destructive. And so the things at that time, they felt normal. But it wasn't normal, though. It was it felt normal because everybody did it. It wasn't normal. So now here's a here's a flash, a flash bomb for the next the next four years. At 11, I'm locked up. Arson, locked up for drug possession, locked up for locked up sent to the youth study center. Making my way through there. I can't be a coward because they're going to take advantage of you. I got to be tough. Uh, after that, by 13, 14, 15, rap sheet, long as the turnpike. That's how I said to me. So now I'm running. I'm catching cases. I'm doing all kinds of mischievous things. So here comes, well, I'm, so here comes 14 years of age. I'm sent away to Vision Quest. Vision Quest, I go, I go there for, I'm sent there. I'm committed to the state for 14 months. Come home. Not even eight months later, man. Not even eight months later, my name is brought up in the mix of a murder, a robbery murder. And that was the most devastating time of my life, man. I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm, I'm on the run now for, at 16, for a homicide. I couldn't believe it, but it was real. So you spent like, from you say like nine to 11, up until like, 13, 14, like basically in and out of the, the system, the, the, from the youth study center to the vision courses. And then when you finally get out of there, you say eight months later, that's when you um been, you know, investigated for the homicide at 16. So when you finally get locked up, charged, and ultimately convicted at 16 years old, and they sentenced you to life in prison, what was that like for you? Throughout the trial proceedings, I felt like I was going to, you know, I was going to win because the circumstances, the facts of the case, uh, gave me like a diminished culpability, if you know what that means. That's like the least amount of uh, participation in the crime. Um, so I didn't think no one actually said this or said that about me, that about a murder, about me, associated that to me. But that's neither here nor there. I'm not, I'm not negating that. I'm not getting past that. I was tried and convicted for it. I stood tall. I did my time. And in the beginning of it, I felt like, man, wow, life without the possibility of parole? Dang. So again, we're going back to that cycle all over again. Okay, this is unfortunate to us, but it's the reality of what it is. So now you go to prison, you can't be thinking about that so much that you're not focused on what's going on in prison. Even as a child, as a teenager, it's still violent in there. It's violent. People want to take advantage of people that don't you know, don't represent what they portrayed out there in that, in that lifestyle, that criminal element. So I got into that. It didn't take long for me to adapt to the prison culture. Now I'm adapting. I'm moving and shaking, as we say. And so in the process of being convicted, and then now you go from state road to upstate, as we call it, in the mountains. I'm sent eight hours away from my family to a place called SCI Green, or Green County, as some people might know. So now, mind you, I'm convicted and all that. This process took all the way to I was 18 for me to go up there because at 18 I, I'm sent to the heavyweight, the heavyweight spot. So at that point, man, I'm just stuck, man. Like, damn, how could this be, man? How could this be? But then I did some things that I shouldn't have did, man. I I, I seen I started seeing people that I didn't know, that I mean that I didn't see in so long. And so 
I'm hanging with them. I'm running to the yards, hanging with them. That wasn't what it was hitting for. So if you out there watching and you out there listening and your family going through them hardships and them circumstances like that of being locked up and being sentenced to either life or death by incarceration, which means 20 or more years, make sure you inform the man. Do not fall short of that law library. Stay in that library because that's what helps get you where I'm at right now in the day. So when you first started, you know, let me jump back a little bit, uh, a little bit. So when you first started jumping out there and becoming mischievous and all that, did you ever think about um, the consequences of actually going to prison and being there for a long time when you was young? Did you ever think about any of the consequences of anything you was doing that would lead you to that? Nah, you know that? nah, man, because when you, like I said, it's, it seemed natural. So when you out there, you out there, you shaking and moving. You like, you kind of numb to what's going on. You know that's a reality. You know that at the back end, back end of that, you can get caught up in that. You could be the borders upstate, but most of us was getting away. When you getting away with the petty crime, the little hand in hand stuff, and the little small and little things that you don't indulge in, and you not being made to stand uh, accountable for your actions, you not you, you you can't feel that. You can't feel like oh man, I, I might go to jail one day because you thinking that you got to run. You got it. I got it. There's no way I can go to jail. So to answer your question, no. Gotcha, gotcha. So. What was your mentality like after sitting in there for a while and then something like, all right, I really got to be in here for a long time with grown men. I'm a young kid still. Like, how did your mentality have to change to even deal with that for that long period of time? Well, once you get past, once for me, once I got past the, you know, uh, rep, uh, the reputation, that, 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 that uh, idea of, Oh, I gotta, I gotta maintain my bravado. I gotta do this. So, the, you know, getting into the fights, all the violent episodes in there, uh, big gang fights, and all that kind of stuff. Once you get past that, and you do years in the hole. And I ain't talking about a couple weeks, a couple months, and nothing like that. I'm talking about two or more years in the hole where you come out 50 or 100 pounds lighter than you went in that joint. But um, once you get past that, once I got past that. I started realizing, man, it's time to make a change, man. I went, I got kicked out of that prison, SEI Green. I went to Smithfield. After Smithfield, I got a promotional transfer to Greaterford. At Greaterford, I realized, damn, it's a whole bunch of um, organizations down here that's created by the men inside the prison that the administration was just letting happen. So I said, damn, let me take advantage of that. The first thing on my agenda was, I heard about an organization called Real Street Talk. I got with them. Man, phenomenal group of guys, man. We go back, we talk to the guys, reoffending, new admits, all that kind of stuff, and we and we try to help them change their criminal criminal lifestyle way of thinking to a positive way of thinking, a hustle, a real hustle, the legitimized business success. That's what we try to do with this. So now I got I got through I you know I went through a phase of that, running through that, running through that. Then another organization started where I was able to go and say, damn, you know what? I could take my son on a visit one on one by myself. This program was called PA Fact. Okay. Fact is an acronym, fathers and children together. We went through that with my son, one-on-one -on -one visits. And all my years in prison, 14 years in prison, man, I never had a chance to sit one-on-one -on -one with my son. And that program allowed me to do that. So we had six weeks, seven weeks visits with that. One-on-one -on -one visits every Thursday night with my son, man. I felt, I felt, you know, validated, man. I felt like I was at a new burst of life, man. And uh so much so that I wanted to become a member. So I became a member of the organization itself, FAT, Fathers and Children Together. Okay, NAACP, uh, Great Panthers, um, the Lifers Organization. All these organizations were started by the men in prison and I be I held a, a role as a board member on every last one of them, right? Um, and so a question I asked myself was, damn bro, you got life. They said you're not never gonna see the streets again. What do you want your legacy to be when it's all said and done? Even if you never walk the streets ever again. So I sat back and I pondered on that and I said, damn, I want him to say, man, this guy was a phenomenal dude. Even, even with the constraints and the confinements that was placed on him by the, by the states, man. Even in here, even if I died in prison, I never made it out here. I wanted to affect people in a way where they, it would be life lasting and life altering, life changing for the best. Right, right, right. All right, so you represent, you know, a population, you know, like an epidemic here in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia in particular, where the juvenile lifers, you know, they say there's more juvenile lifers here than anywhere else in the world. And um, being though you pretty much grew up in prison, like from a young man to a grown man, what's something that you learned going through that process that you could share 
with the youth or the people that's in the streets that's watching that may not have had the experience a long bit, that may not have got, you know, um, um, locked up at a young age and had to go through that process? Like, what's something you can share with them so they can avoid having to deal with that? I'm saying, I'm going to give you this raw and uncut, man. Being in prison is not a good thing. It's not a rite of passage. It's not the cool thing. It's not a self, it's not part of that, it shouldn't be a part of that self-discovery process. If you don't know who you are, them young kids in that room, when I talked to them, they didn't know who they were. But after I talked to them, a lot of them changed their ways, man. Just like that. A lot of them took the, took the, took the advice, and I'm telling you today, prison, when you go to prison, that's your sanction. That's your, that's your sanction, that's your, that's your penalty for the crimes that you committed. But when you get in prison, it's a whole group of, it's a whole, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, man, it's overwhelming how it's another set of punishment for you in there. Yeah, believe that. You go to prison, they give you 20 to 40, they give you life. Yeah, all right, cool. You think you're going to just do that time? Nah, you got some you got some people up there that's in charge of the prison, in charge of running the prison, that they feel like, man, I'm going to get you, I'm going to single you out, and I'm going to oppress you. When your family come to visit, they making them take all their clothes off, the Muslim girls and everything. They making them take, lift their veils up, showing everything. To a woman, of course, but at the same time, it's degrading, it's humiliating, and we, and we shouldn't have to put our families through that. So don't, so, when you out there chasing that package or chasing the bag, like people say, listen, man, when you go to jail, when you go to prison, and you get that astro astronomical numbers like that, you ain't gonna be chasing the bag in jail. You know what you're gonna be doing? You're gonna be calling your mom, you're gonna be calling your wife, your woman, your baby mother, you're gonna fall out with everybody, and after five and ten years, everybody gonna leave. Everybody gonna leave you, bro. I ain't know what it felt like to hug a woman, man. All the women that I knew before I came went to prison, I didn't know what it felt like to hug a woman for 12 years straight, other than my mother. That's why that surprise to me for her was that heavy for me, man. Because everybody leaves. That's just how it goes. It's not malicious. It's not like that. It's not always like that. But life goes on. And when you out there, you don't know how to teach somebody to be ready for you to go do a 20-year bit. How you gonna teach somebody that? You can't. So what you gotta do is you gotta stop being a knucklehead, man. Up, pull up your pull up your pants, tie your boots up, and go out there and hit the workforce, man. That's chasing the bat. That's being positive. That's thinking about a cognitive thought, a cognitive thought process that's gonna give you an alternative life. That's not prison, man. So and you do all this time, and then eventually you get some news about you know, and you got some light at the end of the tunnel as far as you're gonna be released. So when you first get that news, what was your mindset receiving it? Like, did you give up at that point in time? Did you, was your mind shut down? Like, it's never gonna happen? Like, explain that. I remember the onset of it was like 2006, 2007, when, you know, we first was made known that it was a case pending that was gonna possibly give us a chance for freedom. So I'm gonna fast forward past all of that. It was a lot, in between that, it was a whole lot of uncertainty, a whole lot of, man, damn, Hope, ghost hope, as we call it in there, right? It ain't gonna happen, man. You heard some guys say, it. even if you felt it, I felt it sometimes, but I didn't say it because I didn't want to be the pull down for somebody else. But I remember, man, January 26th, 2016, man. I remember January 25th, excuse me, 2016, right? I called home. And my beautiful wife told me on the phone, babe, the case went retroactive. You coming home. And I, I couldn't believe it, man. It was like, I'm feeling right now, I feel goosebumps on my body right now, again. Because that's a hell of a feeling to have to hear, man. That's a hell of a feeling to have to hear. So now, here we go getting resentenced. There's a, there's a, there's a process called the negotiation process. Where, okay, they, the, the district attorney's office is going to negotiate a, a deal for an amount of time, a number to life. Or a number to 20 to 40, or anything like that. Alright, cool. In that, I, you know... I went before a particular um, judge. On the day that my hearing was in front of her, I wasn't there, my family and friends were there. But when on my day, it was 21 cases heard in that courtroom that day. And out of that, on that number, 21st case was mine. And the 20 that preceded me, the judge denied all the, all the negotiations from the district attorney and told him to take it to another judge. And she picked me. When I called home, my wife said, babe, she accepted the, she accepted the time. You coming home. And I looked to my friend that was closest to me. I looked to turn and find somebody closest to me. And I seen a friend of mine 
And he looked at my face, and I'm a big dude, man. I represent strength, and I bring it. I bring pain. That's what I do, right? But I looked at him, man, and he said, what's wrong? And I put my hand in the air and told him, man, I got it. I'm going home. And I cried, man. My big self, man. I cried like a baby, man. I think I cried harder than my mom did on that video. But, you know, I felt, I felt life, man. I felt back to life. So it was about three years from when you first initially got the, the news until you actually was able to get released. Right. So in that three year period, and then the day that you came home, we talked about, it was documented, you know, with your mom and all of that. So when you first got released, like the first time when you actually stepped out the gate, what was going through your mind before you even go meet up with your mom and all that? Or even before you stepped out the gate, like how was you feeling? What was your mentality stepping out after all of that time into the world? It's so different. You were 16 before. Now you're a grown man. Like, so what was that feeling like stepping out of there initially? Man, for nearly 21 years, man, all I saw was brown uniforms for, for, the, for the prison population. Brown uniforms, gray uniforms. Blues for the guys and jumpsuits for the guys, yellow or orange. Yellow meaning you knew you just transferred there. Orange means you in the hole. Blue means you're a return citizen, right? Or a return uh, offender, a repeat offender. Brown means you're a permanent resident, right? And so through transport, you all this is all, the, all that you see. When they walked me up to the processing room that morning at 7 something in the morning, 7.15 in the morning, they took me in the room and told me, here, this is what you're gonna wear out the front door and then when you get outside your family if they brought clothes you'll wear that out you change into that and you'll leave with them they gave me a pair of blue dungarees and the dungaree jacket jean jacket jean pants whatever however you understand it i begin to feel a heavy anxiety because i hadn't touched a pair of denim pants in nearly 21 years and when I put them on, I was surprised that they fit. The jacket was snug. When I walked out that, when I walked out the door, when they said, "Yeah, hey, your family's here first. You can leave first. It's three of us that day." When I walked out the door and I saw my family, I looked up in the sky and I looked around. It was open. All I saw was trees, cars, houses, all in the distance. It wasn't behind Greaterford Wall. I'm leaving from Phoenix, and I began to get emotional because. I knew that while it was a happy moment for me, it was like bittersweet, man, because I'm going to say this man from the heart. Yeah, we celebrating my freedom, my release, right? Because people love me genuinely, because I made it that way, because I'm a good person, right? Despite my, my indiscretions from yesteryears, right? But it was bittersweet for me because there's a victim and that victim has a family and that family has to deal with this process. And I've said sorry a million times and I read this deep uh, letter to the court, letter of remorse to the court. I presented this letter, I, I worked hard for this letter, I read it because I wanted the family to understand that I really, when I really said sorry that I really meant it. Because you can't have a moment. And, I was a, and, I was, and, and, and because I was the perpetrator or a perpetrator in the, in the case, convicted of it, that had to be heavy for them. So therefore, I wanted to say to them, man, I'm sorry. But sorry ain't enough to say to somebody after you took the life of their loved one or after you played a part in it or however it go, right? So I just wanted the world to know, man, that I'm happy. I'm living life. But my retribution for being a part of this is that I'm going to pay it forward and I'm going to try to change the whole world. I'm going to try to take one child, one young, young adult and take them to another level, man. Take them to another level. We're going to get the work done, man. Because we can't have that continuous cycle going on and on and on. And we're losing our babies to the system, man. We really can't have that. So let's let's get together as a, as a, as a community, as a country, as a whole, as, a, as everything, as a nation. And destroy, break down, dismantle the cradle to prison pipeline. That's, that's my retribution so that we won't have no other family suffering from the actions of which, where I did my, for which I did my time for. And on that note, man, like we were talking about how your video went viral and stuff like that, and you was telling me, like, off camera, like, you was planning on building it from the ground up and slowly but surely, you know, getting your name and your message out there 
but it kind of happened a lot faster than you anticipated. So how was that then for you, Benzo? You ain't even been home, what, like a week or so or something? Been home five days, five, man. not even a week yet. So how was the transition coming home and being overwhelmed by all this love and support and attention? Like, what has it been like for you since you've been home? It's been it's been empowering. It's been it's because like it's refreshing because like I said, man, I thought that I was because I'm passionate about the work. I thought that I was going to get out and it's a group of guys that I work with, man, and that we were going to hit the ground from ground zero and just go through to each neighborhood and try to make a difference in the communities one neighborhood at a time. I didn't have no idea that I was going to come out because I'm hearing about social media. I'm hearing about all this stuff, but I didn't know the gravity of it. I didn't know that I was going to come out, man, and just an act of surprise, an act of, 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 of love for my mother and my son, Raheem, my mother, Darlene. All this wouldn't been, wouldn't have been possible, but I only thought that that was my that was my day. And the next thing I know, man, I'm on the I'm on the Q Harris, Quincy Harris, K Fox morning show. I'm here with you right now. Oh man, listen, man, Malik Jackson, my brother. Oh my goodness, man, I'm just my wife behind you. She's my she's my rock. She's my rock, man. I get a little frustrated. She know how to put me right back in check because she know I got work to do, and it's overwhelming to me at times. And it's overwhelming to her as well. But we built for it tough, man. We're gonna get it done. Very, very. And yeah, on, the, on, on that note, far as Malik, I mean, cause like you said, we hear it live from his gym and that's your bro. And we did an interview with him and he shared his story too. And when you had first came home, you had put the picture up and said, yeah, my bro just came home. The last time I really seen him was when we was locked up together. So I want you to speak on, just, just jump back and touch on that a little bit. Man, though Malik did what he did as far as like coming home and now he's on a positive note, got his own gym. He's doing a lot of positive things right now. So what was that like seeing him in there with you, like being locked up with your little bro and then him come home and, and turn up the way he did? Well, it's always a shocker to be like, a thing that's relevant, heavy inside of those prisons, it's a terminology called intergenerational incarceration, right? Intergenerational incarceration. That means in families, you have in prisons, you have a, a grandfather, his son, and the grandson in one prison. Three generations of a family inside of a prison at any time. On a, on a block where I was at, it was two twin brothers. It was uh, a one twin of a, a one, one brother and an uncle. It was a grandfather and a grandson. It was a father and a son. All on this, all on this one block. And then it was my, it was me and my little brother. That was heavy. But I remember coming in, man. He was standing in front of the cell, waiting for me. And you know, I gave him a nice talk, man. And I told him, man, I said, listen, man, go out there, man, and do one thing for me, man. Just it, just one thing. And he looked at me and said, what's that, bro? I said, I don't want no money or none of that. I just want you to win, man. Go out there and win, give it to him. Take what you learned and go out there and give it to him. And in a matter of time, man, when I looked up, I called home, I called him every week. Every Friday, I called him on the phone, like clockwork. What you doing, man? Tell me about your day. Because if he was stressing and he didn't have no outlet, I wanted him to know that I was there. Because a lot of times when you get out in the world, people that's around, they live in their life like it's theirs, man. And they don't think about nobody else. I remember on Fridays, man, I had, a, I had our, in general, I had my own program set up for how my day was structured inside the prison. Friday, I was waiting for two things. Jumu'ah, Friday prayer, and they leave there immediately and come back to the block to call my little brother to make sure his day was all right. And so I would give him words of advice. Stay out there, man. Somebody got on his nerves, listen, man, remember this, man. Remember here. And I would I would remind him. I would just give him positive advice, man, and pull him up, man, from the boots, man. Like, let it, come on, man, let's go, get it together. And the one thing that I told him, man, I think that resonated the most with him, resonated the most with him, was when I told him I was proud of him for his accomplishments early on. I began to get anxiety about that. I still feel the goosebumps coming right now. Because when he told me about his success and I got the articles right now, I said, take me with you, man, vicariously. Let me live through your eyes, man. Take the pictures, man, send them. Let me see it. And I was his biggest fan in the jail, man, running around telling him, man, yo, look at my brother, man, look what he doing, look what he doing. And I had no idea that when I got here, he was gonna be in such a position now that he is now, where it would spill right over to me and open the floodgates for me, and man. And, and now he's telling me he's proud of me. And so now, man, our thing is to move together as a unit, 
and get the work done. All right, all right. All right, man, on that note, man, is there anything else you want to speak on or let the people know before we get up out of here, man? Well, I want to say this, man. Own what you do, man. Be who you are. Don't try to be nobody else. Life is short. Nothing's guaranteed. Live it to the fullest, but live it the right way. I'm out on that note. Yeah. And I'll plug your gram your social media. I know you just made a gram and all that for people yeah. to stay updated. Want to reach out to you, whatever. Go ahead and let them know your, uh, how they can get at you. Um, Raheem Shackleford at uh, on Facebook or on Instagram. And by the way, we got 5.2 million likes on Facebook alone. Y'all know what it is. Y'all been around. Y'all watching the feed. But we gonna do the work, man. Yeah, yeah. All right, man. On that note, man, we signing out, brother Raheem. Now I'm in Philly Fame TV. Philly Fame TV. Live from Malik Jackson Boxing Fitness Gym. We out of here. Like that. Early. Yeah.